Rafi. I will share my screen. Oh, if I could please have it enabled, Rakesh. Wonderful. Okay, so um, let me go right to the start. My topic is called Growing Food in Iceland, quite self-explanatory. Um, I'm based in Iceland now. I've been here for a few months. And what got me to Iceland was uh, an opportunity to assist with an introduction to permaculture with uh, a, very, um, a very talented lady called Hildur. She runs a CSA uh, where she grows food outside. Uh, very, very productive, um, but there are a few uh, limitations when it comes to Iceland, which we will have a look at um, in this presentation. So uh, what I'll be discussing is a brief overview of what's possible in extreme climates, uh, recent innovations and the natural resources, what makes Iceland unique compared to um, other, other places, other countries, other regions. Um, is just an overview um, and we can go into some questions uh, towards the end of the presentation. I'll leave some time for question and answers, yeah? Um, so I find, and I think many other people find Iceland cool in so many ways. So the first image uh, that you see is uh, growing beds. These are uh, raised beds. This is what Hildur was growing. Basically, she dug up little trenches and put the soil onto the side, put hay and started growing food straight into there. Um, I'll go through the list of things that are growing. The next picture would you'd see is uh, greenhouses uh, in the middle of snow. Um, they're well lit, nice and warm. The picture next to them is a place called Friedhema. Here you have a restaurant right inside the greenhouse. They're quite famous for growing uh, tomatoes um, and they have a bunch of other stuff as well that they're growing um, and doing at the moment. Um, and the final picture that you see with uh, some greenhouses and the growing beds is called Akur. <coughs> right now I am working in Akur. Akur is an organic farm where we grow the most common stuff that grow in greenhouses. So in Iceland, there are four crops that grow and these are actually subsidized by the government when it comes to energy there's tomatoes cucumber paprika and chilies so those are the four kind of vegetables um, that are kind of subsidized by government so most of the greenhouses they grow that however i could do a few other cool things which we'll look at in a moment so a few interesting facts which are important um, uh, more than 60% of um, the Icelandic uh, population, um, they're mostly based in the capital, which is Reykjavik. And the rest of it is just small communities that are dotted around. It's the last place that was uh, inhabited by humans uh, because of the, the conditions. Um, it's one of the most eco-friendly countries in the world because of their resources and the energy, which we will go through. 11% is covered by glaciers, and this is mostly the central part uh, and mostly up north in Iceland. The lowest temperature is uh, recorded at minus 39 degrees Celsius, so quite cold, but not extreme, extreme. And nine out of 10 houses are heated directly with geothermal energy. This is one of the cool aspects of Iceland. Um, so on the Copenhagen, it's a CFC. So it is, um, it has um, oceanic and it's subpolar oceanic. So basically um, you get the, the, the Gulf Stream, you get some warm winds that come from the oceans, which kind of keep the coast um, relatively warm, but then it's also subpolar, so fairly cold. Um, it can get to minus zero in the south and north, it gets minus 10. So this just kind of, this is to put 
things into perspective to paint a little picture for you. So the average temperature in July is between 10 and uh, 13 degrees and um, warm days can go between 20 to 25. It is quite beautiful actually in Iceland, especially over summer. It has a quite an interesting landscape, uh, quite um, flat in many areas, but then you have the fjords and you have the hills and things like that. So uh, the main source of energy, this is where things get really, really cool. Uh, it's hydropower. So they have a lot of water. There's no shortage of water, a lot of snow, a lot of rain, a lot of rivers, uh, glaciers. Um, so lot of waterfalls and they start they've um they started actually using that water with small uh, little hydro powered uh, plants and these started off uh, these were started off by farmers who saw the potential and this was quite early so in the 1950 uh, they had about 530 small hydropower plants that were built in Iceland um, and the hydropower plants actually started even before that. The rest of it, 27% of it is geothermal power. So it's quite cool in Iceland. So normally, if you go about a kilometer into the ground, you could then tap into water that would be around 35 degrees Celsius. But in Iceland, if you go down a one kilometer, it goes to my, uh, sorry, to 200 degrees Celsius. So it's super, super hot water. You can see an image to the bottom right. This is where you have uh, geothermal uh, power being harnessed. Yeah. Now, the reason that they have this kind of uh, resource is because of the tectonic plates. Um, there's a separation uh, between uh, Europe and North America. So these tectonic plates, um, they create this heat with the separation and uh, water. There are some places, um, one of them being where I am, called Leogaraus, where you have just hot water springs just coming up. Uh, there's a cool place not too far from here where they've created like a metal oven where steam comes through it and you can actually put bread or food or whatever you want to put in there and close it and you can seal it and actually slow cook your food just outside. This is open to the public. One of the farmers just set it up and people can use it. And it's quite common among other farms as well to actually have these hot water springs. They set it up, uh, they make it like outdoor jacuzzis, uh, not jacuzzi, but like outdoor hot springs and people can use it, the community can use it and leave a little bit of a donation and things like that. So a lot of hot water coming in. Um, what else do we have? Uh, a lot of sheep, a lot, a lot of sheep. So they have uh, 800,000 sheep to 350,000 people. Um, so that's another interesting fact. Uh, with the sheep, what's also cool is that they don't, the sheep farmers, uh, over spring they allow them to just be out and graze um, in in the mountains in the wilderness they just keep some very minor fencing just to keep the sheep uh, safe um, and then uh, just before winter they herd them in and uh, they brought to safety away from the cold and they kept sheltered so that is with those facts so what is growing and where. Now, um, in 2010, we had this whole volcanic uh, eruption. And that was a bit of uh, a scary thing because a lot of food is actually imported into Iceland. Um, so this makes it quite serious for them, especially even during COVID times. Um, this made them aware that they need to be resilient in times of need. So Iceland is taking a lot of steps towards being self-sufficient. They still have a lot of potential and they're slowly getting there. Um, they grow food outside 
uh, most of the time uh, you have root vegetables that grow quite well. You have your potatoes, your turnips, your swedes, your beetroots. Um, you have other things as well that grow. But then again, the, the growing season is about three months. So they really need to make the most of it. This is where they use greenhouses. So the greenhouses, um, most of them, because of the geothermal energy, they're heated. So they have pipes that run through the greenhouses on the floors. They also have pipes that go into the ground and they have pipes on the side. So this creates a very nice warm uh, condition and the water kind of goes through the entire system and it's, uh, it's used to its fullest potential. So this is where you have the warmth, but because it's so far up north, you have times when you don't have as much light. So then this is where they use growing lights as well in the greenhouses. They get a lot of their, their energy from the renewable resources. So energy can, is, is fairly cheap. So very common among the greenhouses is heated pipes plus lights. So when you have those conditions, you can grow quite a lot of things in there. Now in Akur, apart from the things that I mentioned, we also grow herbs, we grow salads, and then they also have bananas. They have, uh, I think about six to eight banana trees. Um, some of them are younger, some of them are more mature. Uh, but yeah, they've yielded uh, bananas in Iceland and they have an agricultural school where they also have bananas. What's interesting is, um, I don't know exactly when, but there was a time where the whole strain or, of a variety of bananas that were commercially grown, because it's a monocrop, there was a disease that kind of wiped out a lot of it. So Iceland, in that um, agricultural school, they have this strain of bananas that are kept growing. So it's almost like a, like a seed bank kind of thing. So those banana trees are kept growing in case they're needed in the future. Um, so in the sea, they have, uh, they cultivate seaweed. So again, before, uh, before things, before globalization, basically, Iceland had to deal with them with whatever they had. Being an island, they had to, to, to look towards the resources that they had. So fish and seaweed were quite um, high up on their diet. Um, so yeah, uh, they do have a lot of fish farming. Um, and then seaweed is something which is kind of picking up. I remember there was a, when I was in, in the Westfields, uh, there was a chef and a, and a scientist who were going all around the coastline promoting seaweed, promoting recipes and showing the people that this is a great resource. It's, it's not only nutritious, but it's readily available. So this is another innovation that I think will come up. Now, um, while I was preparing for this, I found a lot of other cool stuff as well. So there's one company that produces algae. Uh, spirulina would be one of the most popular algae that you would see as superfoods. So uh, what the guy was saying is algae have 40% protein, 40% carbohydrates, and 20% fat. So it's fantastic. So they they use this, they use it in protein powders, and then um, the carbs are used for other resources as well. So it's, it's, it's kind of uh, used to its full potential. They use light and heat and the water that they use in all these greenhouses is pure water. It's very clean. It's the same water that is used for drinking. So there's no shortage of water and it's used quite well. Hydroponics. So the greenhouses that they have in Iceland uh, most of them use hydroponics. We, on the other hand, so the farm where I'm working called Akur, we use soil. So it's a little bit different. It's a little bit more challenging, but the product that you get is a little bit, is quite different. It's, it's definitely superior. Um, 
we put soil amendments, we make sure that the soil is healthy and living uh, as opposed to hydroponically grown uh, crops. So very often you have uh, kind of monocrops as well that are growing in these greenhouses. So a lot of precautions need to be taken. Uh, farmers are super, super cautious when, so for example, I cannot go to other places where they have greenhouses and work over there because of the, the, the chances of cross-contamination because uh, a monocrop can be quite dangerous. Another challenge that they have is with pests, with insects. Um, you have um, the chance of getting a lot of different diseases and insects that will kind of, again, kind of wipe out your, your crop. So one of the things that they do, again, because it's Iceland, you don't have that ability to have beneficial relationships and this kind of uh, food chain. They actually get insects from, from the Netherlands. Now, this is not the best way to be doing things. Very often they use bees as well, pollinate the greenhouses because there's no other way. In Akur, we've tried uh, having bees, but again, the conditions are not favorable, um, at least for them to stay on a prolonged basis. So that's a little bit of a downside to things. Uh, but yeah, they, they're making do with whatever they can, because the other option would be just to be importing food from outside. Now, they do import a lot of food, and you can get a lot of tropical things. The, the market in Iceland taste for for globalized food is quite high so yeah so this is what's growing and uh some areas now over a thousand years ago the vikings came to iceland and when they came they started domesticating um well they came with domesticated animals they started farming so there was a lot of deforestation vikings loved their boats so they cut down a lot of trees they built a lot of houses so what happened is this affected the soil. Erosion and wind and storms and a lot of the soil was taken off. So the whole landscape changed. Iceland used to be quite thickly vegetated, but at this point it's, it's completely changed. Um, the temperature was actually a little bit warmer compared to now. So it's actually going down and then you had glaciers as well. So now there's a change in, 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 in resources, like I said, with renewable energy. Um, and again, like I mentioned, globalization. Globalization is having an effect on Iceland. So people have this kind of need and this desire um, ever since uh, things changed. Before, farming was quite different and they were growing a lot of different things here for the market. But what happened was, people could get cheaper products from overseas, which brought the price down, which kind of forced the, market, the, the farmers out of it. So in order to, to support the farmers, they allowed people to get things from outside, um, import the main things, and then some crops were subsidized with the farmers. So that's why most of the farmers, they grow more or less those four crops that I mentioned, tomatoes, cucumbers, paprika, chilies. It's a sad thing, but that is what is what globalization has done. And um, very often shops, for example, will pull the price down. Um, cool projects. Yeah, so uh, again, Friedhema, like the one I told you, there's a lady standing up. They work over there in the greenhouse while that is going on. A lot of greenhouses have salads and things going on. I talked about the growing algae indoors. Mushroom cultivation is huge as well. There's a company called Fludir Svetter, not too far from here in Fludir. Uh, they grow a majority of uh, the mushrooms for Iceland. And uh, next to it, you can see the bananas. Those were bananas harvested from uh, Akkur. The, the farm where I'm working and on the top you can see some cherry tomatoes. Now uh, what's nice about the place where they grow mushrooms is the, the byproduct is compost. So it's a very high grade compost that is then given to 
whoever wants to use that compost, they sell it. Uh, they sell it at uh, 30,000, including shipping. Uh, well, transportation, sorry, not shipping. Um, so we use that compost to renew the soil um, of our growing beds whenever we're preparing the beds for the next season. Um, yeah, so that's the thing. Uh, we have uh, the farm where I'm at, Akur, will celebrate 30 years of uh, since they, they moved here. Um, they have three greenhouses um, and then, yeah, and nothing growing out at the moment, but I'm hoping to change that. Uh, I've, I've got a, a little piece of land which uh, I've been given permission to grow food, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll keep you updated. Maybe the next time, um, maybe next season, I'll be able to share some better better results and um, yeah. Um, I think that's my presentation. I will stop sharing now. One second. So yeah, you have about eight minutes left. Yeah, so I'm open for questions now. I always forget the, here we go, stop share. Yes, Wim. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Steve, hi. for the presentation. Okay. You, uh, yeah. you you made me remember I really have to visit Iceland someday. Yeah. I think it's a beautiful country. And uh, I had a question. Uh, at the end, you yeah. said I'm planning on yeah uh, starting to grow things outside. Yeah. Would you, would you uh, think that if some kind of a food forest would even be possible over there or would it be something completely different? Yeah, so I have, uh, <laughs> I've, I've gone and connected uh, four farms uh, where I'm working at. There's one which is a permaculture farm, one grows trees, it's the tree nursery, huge tree nursery, and then one is a lady who grows flowers. So I'm kind of connecting all of them. There is a chance that I will do a, a kind of a food forest in one of them. Um, so we're going to start off with a guild. The thing is, you don't have a lot of fruit trees growing. It's not that easy. You can grow trees. Uh, you can have perennials. There's a lot of food that grows out. Um, red currants, black currants, raspberries, rhubarb. They just grow wild like weeds. Uh, there are a lot of nettles around where I live. Um, so the plan is to grow root vegetables. Those grow quite well. Uh, trees will take some time. Uh, but yeah, the next time, if, if, if people want, I can explain or show some of the projects that I'll be working on. They're all in close proximity. Um, and yeah, it's a good, it's a, it's, we might get there with the food forest. Cool. I'll definitely join when you uh, come back for another uh, session. Yeah, thank you. I was interested, Steve, um, in what the renewable source of the electricity was for all the lights in the greenhouses. Yeah, so they use hydropower. So they have these huge dams. Um, so that is where they harness the energy from the hydropower. Um, and they also have geothermal heat that they get uh, electricity from as well. So you have these two resources. So most of the energy is quite clean when it comes to Iceland. Cool. And are they glass uh, greenhouses as opposed yes. to... Yes, most of the, the greenhouses are glass. You have um, some people using polytunnels. Uh, but again, with a polytunnel, there's only so much height you can get. You can't be putting in your lights. So very often they just have greenhouses. Um, there's one place, Reykholt. Again, they have a lot of uh, geothermal energy. They used to have a lot of greenhouses, but all of it is gone. And now it's pretty much uh, a kind of city. Right now, here where I'm in, in Fuelöger, uh, you have some greenhouses, huge greenhouses, but all the glasses are broken and things like that. It's, it's very sad 
to see the state of some of these things because it's not easy as well to maintain this. You need to have that kind of uh, yield or that return to have to sustain this, this, this business because there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I've been looking at some of Martin Crawford's work where he's um, doing some experiments with forest gardens in polytunnels in the UK. Yeah. And that's right. also interesting, kind of on the one hand, the more like native wild foods in forest gardens outside, and then what you could do with the um, with this uh, geothermal energy in terms of a yeah. forest garden inside a big glass house would be interesting. Yeah. So I saw there's another geothermal way of doing things. So here it's all about hot water, but then I've seen a one design where they have the, the greenhouse, but instead of water, they use the, the heated air. So the, the air gets heated and there are two fans. One extracts the air from the greenhouse where it's hot and it goes through the soil. So it heats up the, the root zone and then it goes back into the greenhouse um, a little bit drier. And in the night, again, it kind of swaps. Uh, so it, it changes. Um, I was also looking at uh, a place in, in, um, in Norway called Svalberg. There's one guy who's doing permaculture there. Uh, he has a website, I think it's called Polar Permaculture. There's nothing, there's no soil, there's only you only see ice, but he has a geodome, which he's using, and then he's using stuff in his house uh, with light. It's about so growing he started off, uh, with herbs and uh, some salads, microgreens. So he, he supplies the, the local chefs and the supermarkets over there. But it's a small operation, but it's quite nice to see what he is doing. Um, he even has, um, so in the geodome, not very big, he had a little tent and inside the tent you had the earthworm. So you have different uh, kind of levels of heat. And then afterwards you had towers. So basically over summer, you have 24 hours of sunlight. So that's where he thought I need to get a greenhouse. I don't need to use electricity. So it's a very, uh, his name is Benjamin. I forget his full name. But yeah, if you, if you check up polar permaculture and you put Benjamin, you'll see a few of his videos. Very, very cool videos. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's very promising. Um, and there's, there's so much that can be used over here uh, in terms of resources. A lot of, so they have these places called Sorpa, where they have like recycling units. When I went there, I saw a mountain of wood chips, like a mountain. And then next to it, a lot of just dead trees that have been pruned and kept on the side. Um, so, and then next to it, there was a whole skip full of old leaves. So there is a lot of potential. So yeah, I'm looking forward to people coming to Iceland and making a, a positive change. Yeah. Wow, wonderful. That sounds like a forest garden heaven right there. You've got yeah. all yeah. the materials you need to start you off. Everything is there. So um, we might have a community uh, project with uh, the gentleman who runs the place, uh, Toti. He wants to get people all connected. It's, it's crazy. So I am working between all these four farms they just next to each other and they don't really communicate with each other and they don't know what's going on. Um, so it, it, it's crazy. But hopefully we will change that. So the whole idea is to kind of create this, uh, this link between community. And, and, and I openly tell them, you know, so I go and help one farm and I got eggs from that farm. So I took the eggs and I gave it to another guy for advice. And then he gave me something else and I take it to the other one. And I'm constantly telling them this came from that farm and that came from this farm. So, yeah, hopefully they'll get, they'll understand that together they can actually do much, much more compared to them doing things individually. Wonderful. 
So we have officially yeah. now a break time of 10 minutes, but everyone's cool. welcome to carry on chatting if you want to, if you have any more questions for Steve. Yeah. So the next session will 